Okay. It being 534, we're running just a few minutes late. We'll go ahead and get started this evening. Uh, this special public hearing for Ordinance 1290-2019. The public hearing is discussion related to the adoption of Ordinance 1290-2019, amending Part 12 of Planning and Zoning and Development, Chapter 2, Zoning General and District provisions of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Tahlequah, including but not limited to definitions and uses permitted in R1 single family dwelling, R2 two family dwelling district, R3 multifamily dwelling district, C1 neighborhood commercial district, C2 general commercial district, I1 restricted light industrial district, and I2 light industrial district. No votes will be taken. And with that, um, I guess we're going to open this to general discussion. Ms. Well, Johnson, I mean, would you like to? Yeah, let me set the stage, talk about the proposed changes a little bit. Hello, hello. So, at the last meeting, I, uh, I presented this little table right here. These are the, the meat of the changes that we made, broken down to what's defined already within our code and where it's placed, where we propose to change it to, what district we propose the change to go to, and then the new definitions that are undefined that are, most of those are primarily related to medical marijuana operations. So what I've highlighted here are the definitions that we've either created, modified, <laughs> And desire to modify, like for instance, um, the bed and breakfast has, has been discussed heavily, and the difference between it and some of our other um, uses, like tourist court, is just the lack of breakfast being served. And so we've talked about maybe we should eliminate the definition of tourist court, which is at the top altogether, and just rely upon the definition of bed and breakfast with a you know, small modification to the whole breakfast being served thing. Um, we, the new definitions are, like I said, um, commercial grower, marijuana dispensary, and marijuana processor. Um, pretty much cited from state statute is where we drew those definitions. Tourist home is an existing definition that we have and a permitted use. It's just that it doesn't have a zoning district that it's permitted in. So we've always had this definition of tourist home, but there's never been anywhere that it was allowed to be um, in operation. And so you can see there the difference between the tourist court and the tourist home is the presence of a permanent resident. A tourist home has a permanent resident. Let's say you leave for the weekend, it's Cherokee National Holiday, and you want to rent out your house for the weekend while you go somewhere else. That'd be a tourist home. Tourist court, it has no permanent resident. Its primary function is a temporary sleeping facility. And um, you get that. So some of the places that we're proposing to put, some of the new definitions, the modified definitions and the existing definitions. We're going to start with R1. And so we did make a modification to general purpose farm or garden. And we, we tried to make it where it's non-commercial. So hobby farms and things like that. Um, that's open for discussion. I don't think that's something that we've discussed a lot in council about that change. Um, that's just a proposal that uh, Grant and I have discussed um, while drafting this. Tourist home, which, like I said, is the, your Airbnb, your VRBO, uh, bed and breakfast situation where there is a permanent resident there. Um, its primary, primary use is a permanent residence. We've placed or proposed to place in R1. Those are the only changes in R1. In R2, 
we proposed to place tourist court, which that is the the sole purpose of that is for temporary sleeping facilities. There is no permanent resident, and we propose moving bed and breakfast there, or changing the definition of bed and breakfast, putting it there, and removing tourist court altogether from the code. R3, that's where bed and breakfast currently um, is a permitted use. It's the only change that we're, promote, we're proposing in R3. C1 is your neighborhood commercial district. This is probably the, um, the point where all this discussion started with, and it is with that first item, floor, shop, greenhouse, and nursery. That those are uses that have been permitted in the C1 neighborhood commercial district since its existence. So we're proposing to move greenhouses and nurseries out of C1 and I believe we have it placed in I-1 light industrial at this time. Uh, marijuana dispensary is a new definition, a new permitted use, and we have settled on C-1. It's where we've always thought it was appropriate, and we actually removed the, lifted the moratorium on applications for those um, operations at the last meeting. C2, which is your general commercial district, the permitted uses here that we looked at. This is where Tourist Court had, or is currently, a permitted use, is, is in C2, which is, you know, uh, in a lesser restrictive zoning district than your bed and breakfast. Although, like I mentioned earlier, the only difference is serving breakfast. So. That's kind of why we propose striking it from the C2 general commercial and moving it to the R2. Automobile service stations is something that um, we've had issues with. They come in all different shapes and sizes. And the, the second one down, the new and used machinery repairing um, has caused us issues on enforcement because we have a one-size-fits-all approach and not all automobile and machinery um, repair places are similar in nature or size and so that is something that we want to look at uh, modifying and maybe creating a couple different categories we'll go back up to those definitions this is just some proposed language we have automobile minor service automobile major service and so those are some, maybe a way to tackle the, the one-size-fit-all situation that we have existing in today's code. Something else in the C2 is it currently says, I don't know it's not all highlighted, it currently says storage warehouse. It doesn't say rental units. Well, when you read the descriptions of the zoning districts the warehouses are identified as being an industrial district and so we're proposing to move anything referencing warehouse into the industrial districts and here we've struck warehouse and storage unit rentals which doesn't exist in the code and so that would be a new one and maybe we'd have to provide a new definition for that not every permitted use has a definition in the code and that's something that's caused us problems you know like i said um, automobile service station that's not defined in the code automobile service station is not defined in the code and so that's why we looked at those two new definitions there And then used automobile sales, I don't know how that ended up in C2 um, and not in the C3 open display. New automobile sales are only allowed in the C3 open display, but for some reason used automobile sales are allowed in the C2 general commercial. So we're proposing to move that into the C3. The I1, and so, all right. This is where we have to talk about that since I just talked about that. 
So I've given Grant a little head for his description that you have to read at every council meeting. Well, C3, open display commercial district, isn't included in that description. So if we want to make any modifications to C3, we're going to have to republish if we want to do it. We've got time. So, um, if you like some of the proposals where we're moving some things to C3, like used automobile sales, then we will need to republish and make that modification to the agenda item that includes C3 open display commercial district, which I think is probably the smart thing to do after we've already headed down this path. So, that's why we jumped to I1 here, light industrial. And that's where we're proposing the commercial grower, the greenhouse and nursery, which were part of C1, and florist, shop, greenhouse, and nursery was how it was listed. And we've separated that out, left florist, shop, and C1 neighborhood commercial, and moved greenhouse and nursery to I1. Laundry and cleaning establishments. Um, that was located in um, C2, I believe, and that's something that we probably want to come up with a new definition for the places that are actually doing the drive with the, um, I think it's called PERC, the actual chemical that actually dry cleans the, uh, not the people that are just doing the pressing and things like that. So we might want to look at a definition for that to be moved into I1. The processors, the medical marijuana processors, we've settled on I-1 as well. And there again, talking about the host wholesale distribution centers, and we've added that warehouse from C-2 onto that permitted use. And that was anti-climate. Um, so, we're not making any modifications to I-2 or I-3, our zoning code is cascading. So when you're in a less restrictive district, you can do anything in the more restrictive districts. And it sounds funny when I say less, but I-3 is the least restrictive district. You can do anything in I-3, essentially. And so it gets more restrictive as you move down towards R-1 single family. So currently, there aren't any locations, any parcels that we've identified that RI1, the light industrial. But like I said, we do have a cascading zoning code, so if they find a parcel of I2 or I3 and do want to do something permitted in I1, that's okay, that's how it works. So, you have any questions about our proposals or comments that we're putting out there? Well, we have some people behind sure. you who oh. have some comments, so Absolutely. are we ready to open this to the floor? Sure. If you would step forward and be sure and give your name so we've got it for the record. Hi, my name is Dana Warren. Um, I just really just wanted to ask a question. Could you give us an example of, because we're not in the lingo of I-1, I-2, I-3, or a map of the city where those areas already exist? Where the eyes already exist? Yes. So it's primarily around the industrial park. Okay. And then the other little section of town is from 4th Street south, like where the old um, rodeo grounds and um, the like Roundup Al Club. Muskogee? No, no, more no, central, Muskogee west. Avenue. Okay. So 4th Street, Muskogee Avenue. So right there where the little triangle of Park Hill comes in, that's all I, across the street's I. Give me a, um, is there a business out there? Um... The, um, the old William Shooting Supply that was right there on the Triangle of Park Hill. Um, there. Yep, across yeah, across from Henry. Thank you, Okay. Yeah, okay. That's, that's, that's I-2. So those are I-1, I-2. There's no I-1. There is no I-1. Mm -hmm. well, like I said, it, it is cascading, so if you find an I-2 or an I-3 <laughs> parcel, you can do anything that's alive in I-1. Okay. So I guess my question to the council would be this in consideration of what we're talking about tonight. When we, as I understand it, Clint, in, in what you've just described, a processor or a grower could only be located then in that 
I1 district. Essentially any of the I's. Okay. Because that's the so most restricted. So tell me, I. save a lot, or um, not save a lot, uh, family dollar on Muskogee. What is that? It, I, mean, I can pull up the map. I think it's um, C2 General Commercial. Okay. So, and the one across the street, I'm guessing, is the same where Domino's is. Mm -hmm. and, okay. So, I, I guess my, my concern would be, we have all of this open retail that has been dormant for 13 years. And I understand that our ideal for this town would not be that we would have marijuana growers or processors in those spaces. But is it better for us to have something in those spaces rather than them be dormant and not producing anything. Um, and then how restrictive are we being to this new economy if we locate them into these very restrictive areas when we've got a ton of low, low rent areas that they could be occupying. So that's it. Thank you. Does anyone want to reply to that at all? I had a conversation earlier today about zoning districts within the city and I was told that uh, in relation to uh, adopting our comprehensive plan, that is our opportunity to re-look at which pieces of town ought to be what zones in a global fashion as opposed to having individuals come forward and have something requested to be rezoned. And do we have in that comprehensive plan, I'm guessing there's a, a layout of where those areas would be? There's land use suggestions. Okay. But not necessarily adopted yet. Correct. Okay. And I think the issue is that the growers and the chemicals and the smells even though it sounds good in theory that they occupy the vacant space like you said it's been dormant for a very long time it's the neighbors that are around those that are complaining about those airborne contaminants and odors and so potentially by putting them there you may be running off everything that's around them and so there's a for every pro there's also a con that has to be considered as i understand it other comments Are we doing the marijuana? We can talk anything you want to talk about. <laughs> as long as it's on the agenda. Okay. <laughs> yes. Hi, my name is Connie Stacy. First, I want to thank each one of you for being here. I'm sure you had a long day, and uh, I know that you're working hard to um, develop our city and to maintain standards, so I appreciate that. You know, as you know, I'm here about the bed and breakfast. Um, my concern is mostly how we're going to protect our children uh, with these um, businesses being in single family neighborhoods. Uh, let me find my paper here. Last year, Several of us got together with our own funds and we wrote um, an article for the newspaper uh, and I'd like to read that right now. And it's, it, it was headlined, Protect Our Children. Presently, our city council is considering changes to zoning laws that will allow Airbnb businesses to operate in residential areas next to schools. Also called bed and breakfast, these businesses expose our children to possible dangers from tourists and transients who use these facilities. We want to protect children from sexual predators or others who could prey on school children in close proximity to the Airbnb. We are opposed to an Airbnb, i.e. bed and breakfast, tourist court, or tourist home within 300 feet of a school. We urge you to help us by contacting your city counselor in support of our children. Now, I would like to amend that 300 feet um, to 1,000 feet of a, of a school. I believe last council meeting, um, 
we talked about there being a, a state law that says uh, liquor stores have to be a thousand feet from churches. Wasn't that what you said, Mayor Catron? I did not say that. Okay, well, I believe that's what it is. There is a law requiring a distance between church and, and uh, liquor stores. Also, the state requirements for sex offender, which I have a copy here if, if you would like them, um, they require a sex offender to be, uh, to not loiter or, or walk or be around a school within 500 feet uh, of a school or a child care center. And they can't live within 2,000 feet radius of a school, playground, park, or child care center. <clears throat> they have a zone of safety. That 500 feet is called a zone of safety that they can't walk around or loiter around. Um, we're not against bed and breakfasts at all. I totally am not against bed and breakfasts at all. I'm just concerned about the children. I know that some of you are, are parents, and if you had a bed and breakfast that was going to house 20 people that was across the street from you or your school where your child was, and um, there could be, there's no way to know who's going to stay in those facilities. They don't, there's no way to know if it's a, a, a pedophile or, or, or a, a, a sex offender or even just drunkenness, a lot of partying going on and that kind of thing around where your child goes to school, that your child could be exposed to that or even be in danger uh, from that. <clears throat> um, I think last, I'm going to paraphrase, but there were some council members on the 9-3 uh, meeting, and this is paraphrase, that uh, commented that times are changing and we need to keep pace with that. And if you fight Airbnbs, you're losing. Uh, we want to keep pace, and we absolutely don't want to lose whatever lose meant. I don't know what that meant, but we don't want to lose. I, I don't like losing anything. But we just want to make sure that our children are protected. Um, now, one size doesn't fit all for automotive, and maybe one size doesn't fit all for bed and breakfast. I don't know. But I just want to make sure that the children are protected. Thank you very much. I appreciate your comments. My name is Craig Clifford, and I'm neither speaking for or against any of the proposals, but I, uh, I don't think anybody maybe was present years ago when this same issue was being discussed by the council related to bed and breakfast. And I just am flabbergasted by the connection between bed and breakfast and pedophiles. I just, just cannot comprehend the, the, the linkage and I'd love to see some studies done that uh, point out or correlate the presence of bed and breakfast or Airbnbs with any particular group of individuals uh, not even worrying specifically about pedophile. Thank you. Connie Stacy again. Um, there may not be studies available right now because as you know the bed and breakfast movement is moving quickly and it's new. But the chance of somebody who is available or renting or living in or whatever a bed and breakfast that may not be of the best character including 20 people in a facility uh, that would be in, a, in a close proximity to a school could endanger children. That there's no way to know who's going to stay in them. So uh, it was commented uh, last year at a, at a council meeting, city council meeting, and I'm sorry, I don't remember which one, uh, but it was commented that if somebody had enough money to stay in a bed and breakfast, well, how could they be considered uh, unworthy or, or a pedophile or something like that but it, it you know if if you could show me where it says there's a dividing line uh, when it comes to income 
about who is going to be a sex offender or or have uh, drunken parties or even be a pedophile uh, and then below not as much of a, of a risk, uh, then I would like to see that too. So it's just, um, there's no way to predict who can stay in them. Thank you. Welcome. I just think that the key word, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think your key word there is prevention. Yes, that's exactly. Prevention, not protection. Protection and prevention. Hello, I'm Stephen Wright. I own actually a few Airbnbs in town. Um, I'd just like to clarify a few things about how the process works. So, when somebody registers in VRBO or Airbnb, they have to give their name. I have a requirement that I have to have their picture, uh, phone number, email address, credit card, basically all the information that says who they are. Now, um, I'm with Mr. Clifford. I don't see the connection between pedophiles and Airbnbs. I would think that people of that nature would not want to register in a system and be tracked, which Airbnb does uh, cross-check their date of birth with their name with local registries. And if something pops up, they do kick them out and they do terrorist watch list. I don't know if anybody's concerned about terrorists, but that's there. Um, the hotels on Downing are 750 feet away from Cherokee Elementary. and if I was a person of um, that type of nature, I would probably go to a hotel where I could bring a wad of cash and stay for a week, right? That's two and a half blocks from an elementary school. And I don't, I don't see how that's acceptable if, if we're not gonna let these be by the schools either. So um, that's just something to consider. And, I don't know, it's just frustrating. You know, how do we know that the renter's son who's staying in the house for a week, a regular renter, let's say the rent house behind you is, is a regular rent house and their son stays for a week. How do you know that he's not a pedophile? How do you know that your neighbor that's already there isn't a pedophile? How do you know that nobody in this room is a pedophile? We don't know, but saying that these types of places are gonna attract those people is not that's a. Um, that's not what I said. I didn't say they were going to attract them. I said they could possibly stay there. Right, and so could rent houses. But you know, at what point do we do we draw the line on how close these close these places can be? What I would say is that the people who own these properties do not want these type of people staying here too, and we'll do everything we can to prevent it. Um, just like parties and things like that, you you can't really control who your neighbors are and what they do. So, thanks. Stephen, out of curiosity, um, did you look at the, also by Heritage, the hotel out there? Isn't that also close proximity? Yeah. Which I can't even remember the name of it now. Is that like Cambridge or something? Roadway Inn. Roadway Inn? Yeah. Okay, it's changed a couple of times. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the first, I mean, you can, if <laughs> Nate probably. King was here, I'm sure you could ask him where Seven. you can stay for a week for a lot of cash and it's going to be Downing Street. So um, those two, two hotels are between Greenwood and Cherokee. There's kids walking all around there and nobody has, has come to council for the children worried about that. So um, it's just it's just a bit concerning. I understand the different neighborhoods and if it's in your neighborhood how you definitely don't want people partying and things like that next to you and, and I fully sympathize with that. Um, but I don't think I don't think the um, pedophile angle is appropriate. So thank you. Any questions of me as an Airbnb owner, I'd be happy to answer from anybody on, on how it works. Um, I just have a question to because mm -hmm. I you kind of went over it fast but so the system in Airbnb you said checks the person and then it checks their name to yeah it cross-references their name and their date of birth and you can look on Airbnb site when it goes through any public registries that are available that they have in their system and if they're on a list it kicks them out now it's not a full background check but when you stay at any hotel in town you don't get a background check. When you stay at your cousin's friend's house, you don't get a background check. So what's the difference? 
The I difference. Can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you. Okay. If, tell if you're going to speak, you got to come yeah. up. Nancy Dyson. Uh oh. And the difference between a motel and an Airbnb in a residential area is very clear to me. Uh, it, and it's the zoning. I mean, people know motels are in commercial zoning, but to put a semi smaller motel in a residential area, that's deceptive. That's deceptive to children. They think, oh, I'm in a nice neighborhood. I mean, they may not cognitively think of everything about this, but they feel safer in a neighborhood than what they would going to a motel. Kids aren't stupid. So that's the difference to me. I think the parents, I'm sorry, but I think parents are more aware, I'm sorry. So what's the difference between that and somebody renting a house on a six month lease? Uh, they have to check in with the sheriff's office, but they have two to three days Does when they arrive here. That's state law. I mean, does their buddy from college who's going to stay with them for a week have to? Well, now watch what you're doing there because you, when you check in people out, it's going to be 20 people in your house. Which one do you check out? The one that pays money? Okay, okay. Let, let's not get into discussions I, I, back I mean, and forth just, so well, much as... What, what, my, what my point of this is, is that there's no way to verify who's in any house and... and I think that this has been a reason to, to kind of prop up not wanting them in neighborhoods. I think it's easier to just say, I don't want this going on next to my house, but I think taking the pedophile route is a, is a bit much. So that's that's my only point. And the ones I own are in C2, so I, I'm not in residential anyways, so. Okay. Yes, sir, Tom. I have something. Uh, I'll go Mr. Bernard first. Okay. I'll try and be quick. Um, as far as the, the pedophile thing, uh, at a federal level, they've already decided that, that 500 feet is the safety zone. Seems like that's already been addressed. That's already in place. Another, another, rule, another rule to keep them away from schools would be redundant. Um, that's true. What I'm saying is, the laws governing pedophiles is already written. So this discussion should be about the business, the business owners, the neighborhoods, not about pedophiles. That's already covered. Great. Thank you. Pamela Coons, I only have a question about specifications. This says 20 people in a bread and breakfast, bed and breakfast. If I was on Martha's Vineyard, I might expect 20 people. But should we, in a town the size of Tahlequah, allow a bed and breakfast to have up to 20 people because of parking? I'm just thinking of logistics. That seems a bit excessive, the number for Tahlequah. That's just my question. Should that be more like 10? Or do we even have one that exists? Yeah. And when you're talking about 20 people, that's something you find in a, in a pretty large uh, tourist area. But if you think about 20 people in your neighborhood, that's my only question, that it just seems excessive to be in a neighborhood. I, all the other issues, that's the only thing I have, is the numbers seem to be a little high. Is there a reason for 20? That's what it currently is in the code. It is the code? Today. But we're changing things, correct? Well, that's what the, yeah, correct. You could if we change things, perhaps you should look at the code it. and maybe reduce that number to 10. You might have some less resistance just from being in people's neighborhood. That was my only issue. It just seems as if it's an excessive number. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. I would, I don't, I don't necessarily disagree with that, but I would also just that's not all assuming that they're all adults a 20 person adult you know if my wife's family were to all come to town there's one sister that has four children one sister that has one child another sister that has four children and then my family would have 
two children. I mean, so you had a... I would like to address that as well. All these people won't be staying in the same room. So how many rooms are you going to allow in a bed and breakfast is my question for occupancy. I see with your family, but still, if you bring your wife and your mother-in-law and things, you're going to have more than several rooms. And I'm just thinking of parking and everything. That's just my only question. 20 just seems excessive. I want to go back just a little bit to the laws and the laws regarding sex offenders. I think that our ordinances and our laws should reflect what is already in state law. And I think that Connie uh, spelled it out, what is in state law. And I think our laws should be in compliance with, with the state laws. I don't think we should be going out on a limb here. I think that we should try to protect the children. And there, there are state laws for a reason. And uh, even though some people may not understand, uh, but I do, uh, I understand why there's laws. And it's to help prevent, help prevent uh, an awful situation for a child. Thank you, Nancy. Other comments? I agree with Nancy uh, that it is true that, st that it's already addressed in state law as a sexual sex offender, but it's not addressed in people who are who are coming in from other states and who are uh, maybe haven't been convicted yet. It's uh, and it's it's why are, I don't know why we're just pulling out this pedophile or sex offender. That's not the only concern that we have. It's strangers, it's people that we don't know, having close access to our children. It's, I, I know that he says that they're tracked by a birth date or something like that, but if that were efficient for tracking uh, people who had issues that could harm children, then we would have those kinds of systems in place trying to prevent uh, injury to our children rather than background checks and all the other things that we have in place to try to prevent injury to our children. So it's not just sex offenders or pedophiles that we're concerned about. There's also increased traffic, which could be an automobile accident. Uh, there's difficulty parking where they can't see maybe when, when they're backing out. Uh, in a school area where there are a lot of children, there are a lot of issues. So we're just trying to protect the children by inserting, and it will be very easy if that were up, uh, to insert a distance that they can operate in within a school and still be in R1 uh, district. So that's my comment. Thank you. Do You're we welcome. have other concerns with bed and breakfast other than the individuals who might be staying there? I don't know that mine is necessarily a concern, although maybe it is just on the other side. Um, if we're going to address this whole Airbnb issue in Tahlequah, I think we need to address the hotel motel tax. So I reached out to a friend in Bentonville, Visit Bentonville, the finance director there. She sent me the breakdown of their agreement with Airbnb and how that works out for them. Um, I don't know if you all have spent any time in an Airbnb. I just happened to poll my students today, um, knowing that this was coming up on the agenda. And in fact, I and every student in the class starts their search first on Airbnb and secondly with a hotel for any town they want to visit. So I would caution us to be careful. I certainly can understand that it does increase traffic. I don't know that I understand the protecting of the children because I think there have been enough arguments to suggest that Reeser's is closer, the Holiday Inn at Reeser's is closer to any neighborhood than, or any sketchy place on Downing is close to neighborhoods. So, and sketchy, here's the deal. Guns don't kill people, people kill people, same thing, right? Doesn't matter where they stay, people are just sketchy individuals. So, I would prefer us to look at how can we benefit Tahlequah as tourism is our second largest industry and could easily be our first if we can be progressive in this thinking? And how do we place a tax on that that benefits Tahlequah so that we can put some of these things in place and maybe even some sidewalks so that people can get to and fro safely? That's it. Thank you. Dr. Rizzo. Yes. Uh, 
Oh, I just have a few brief comments. Remember when people buy a house for quiet and peaceful enjoyment, they don't really want to have a lot of business activities in there because it's a domestic residence. And the other thing I would request, is when you, if you do amend these regulations, that if we have restrictive covenants in our agreement for our neighborhood, that the city council honor those that are in existence and not cause protracted litigation. Like we had to get involved in a situation in the neighborhood that I'm in. The council overruled our restricted covenants. We spent two years in litigation to win and substantial legal costs associated with it. I was going to say the city has no uh, business in a neighborhood's covenants and things of that nature, regulations that are internal with the neighborhood itself. We don't micromanage your all's covenants. So that'd be the homeowners association yeah. grant. The homeowners association would be the one you would. Well, what, what I'm saying is, is we, we object to the operation of commercial <coughs> organization based on restricted Well, if covenants. you have that in place, that's between you and those homeowners in your association. That has nothing to do with the city. That's a separate civil contract, so you're good. The city will not uh, try to, you know, violate those covenants. We don't have, anyway, well, what, what you're saying is it will not be an issue for the city of Tahlequah. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, Mr. Lloyd, but the fact of it is, we had to go through and enforce those covenants. Well, yeah, the city does not have to enforce the neighborhood's covenants, correct. Okay. That's up to the homeowner, homeowners association. It always has been, it always will be. That's that's a covenant for a homeowner association to enforce. Okay, well, I'm unaware how the litigation existed, but the fact is, since we had those in existence, and somehow we had to go to the court and justify those, and it took two years sure. of yeah. a lot of legal yeah. expense. Again, because the city did not make those covenants, it's the homeowners association. Right, right. 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 Okay. And most of the th things in town that do not have those restrictive covenants in place. Correct. Right. That's the problem that you're, you're all going to have to address. But those homeowners could bind together if they really want to have extra protection or what have you and make their own homeowners association and put in forth some covenants. That's a great recommendation. So, I mean, Thank that's you. kind of a, maybe a saving grace for the people in opposition with this concept. They could always band together and do their own covenants if they choose okay. to. Well, thank you for that recommendation. Hi, you're so tired of me, aren't you? <laughs> I just wanted to say again that I or any of us are not against B&Bs, Airbnbs uh, at all. We're not against them. We are against the close proximity to school while they're zoned in a single family neighborhood. That's what we're against. We want to insert a amount of feet that they cannot operate within proximity of the school. Miss Stacy? Yes. I was going to say, Stacey. I think that everyone here has heard that and okay. thought it back was, well, there's already a 500-foot bubble already in place by law today. Well, that's for sex offenders. What about the other items that I brought up? That's only for sex offenders. That's not counting uh, other undesirable traits, uh, the increased traffic, the... Uh, and, and I guess... I'm not I'm just putting it out there to maybe save some time on the discussion but I think that the counterpoint to that would be we already have other parts of our code that say you can only have a certain amount of cars parked in front of a residence you can only have you can't be parked on the street longer than X all these different things that would would, would solve those problems yeah first. and if you know it enforced. would be yeah well, that, that's another topic <laughs> that's another that's, topic but you know wouldn't it be horrible for us to say okay we're just gonna let Airbnbs come into residential neighborhoods uh, and not worry about the children, and then we tax them and increase our profits as a city. Hey, just, excuse me. Yes. Um, because I think you said in a residential area, and I want to make sure we're clear that that's not the R1. Is that correct? Not BME. What we're proposing is the tourist home in R1, which is has a permanent resident, and maybe for a weekend they rent their home. Right. But they have a permanent resident. Correct. Okay. But the unoccupied or un yeah, where where its primary use is a temporary sleeping facility we're proposing r2 okay and the area that they're concerned about is currently zoned r2, well, r2. Okay. well we don't know what area they're <laughs> concerned about okay it's all areas it's okay. every area okay. Gotcha. and currently anyway bed breakfast is currently r3 and part yep. of clint's proposal would be to bring that to, to r2 to bring it to r2 right okay. and tourist court is C2. Correct. Okay. Thank so, you. You're welcome. I'll try not to be back up.
Um, it's my understanding that part of the proposal and the discussion tonight includes changing some zoning that will uh, greatly and negatively impact uh, people who own homes in residential areas R2 and R3 and if this is passed by this council uh, it would allow a business uh, which would be the Airbnb to move from C2 where it currently is and it would jump all the way up to R2 residential areas and that's quite a jump uh, to put a business in a residential area uh, and this proposal would move businesses into neighborhoods and hurt the homes uh, and their equities there's a lot of people that the equity in their home is their life savings and for you all to be considering about affecting people's life savings I hope that you take it very very seriously and give it a lot of thought and moving an Airbnb all the way up to R3 and R2 is going to negatively impact those people's homes and the value of their homes. Just play devil's advocate because I don't have, I mean, whatever the council wants to do, but I'm curious if there is any data supporting that because you might argue actually the other way that commercial industry brings a higher market than a residential industry. Have you ever held a, an appraiser's license, a real estate appraiser's just, license? Have you? Yes, I sure have one. Okay. I have had one in the past. I've been a successful real estate appraiser. And that's a little bit different than a real estate salesperson. And I'm not disputing what you're saying. I'm just asking if you have any facts here today to consider versus yes. just the speculation. Uh, from my training and my experience, I'm telling you, uh, it will lower the values a lot if you have that uh, sticker on there the permit a business permit on the house next door a real estate appraiser will look at that and say this is a non-conforming neighborhood and they're going to know about the problems with airbnbs the traffic and the transients that's mr clinton's word uh <coughs> coming through there all the time so yes uh i i can completely uh say that it will affect the homes negatively. There's a lot of voters that live in R2 <coughs> and R3, and I hate to see that their homes would be negatively affected by these R, uh, Airbnbs coming in. Thank you, Nancy. Well, <coughs> at the last city council meeting, uh, there was some discussion that there's no way to enforce the ordinances about Airbnbs. So let me tell you how lots of ordinances are enforced uh, they're enforced by neighbors complaining and that's the way a lot of our ordinances are enforced and I believe that mr. Johnson has had complaints about Airbnbs going back a couple of years um, and the way it usually happens when people don't comply with the ordinances they're sent a letter uh, there could be a lien placed on their property through the county clerk's office I believe that has happened through the city council in the past so that's how ordinances are enforced is usually by neighbors complaining and to Clinton's credit he tried to enforce it <laughs> just didn't get it done uh, but uh, also at the last city council meeting it was said that we should we should embrace does anybody remember that word? We should embrace these Airbnbs. Yep, I think I said it. <laughs> uh, no, it was a city councilor up here. Oh, okay. It was from the last city council meeting. And he said we should embrace, it's in the YouTube, uh, that we should be embracing these Airbnbs. That's not a direct quote, but that is a summary. He did use the word embrace. But what he really should have said is that he wants all the people in R2 and R3 to embrace the RBNBs. I did a little research, and I believe all the elected people up here, and even including you, I believe you all live in R1. And R1 is not going to allow Airbnbs in it. So well, you are actually going under the proposal, 
Yes. But I think One. we should. And that's how they do it in other well, communities. Just, could just you wait a minute? Just to be clear as to what's been proposed tonight by Clint. And maybe Clint wants to clarify, but I'm trying to just make sure yeah, we're all on the same sheet We're proposing a tourist home, which it would have the permanent resident in R1. Right, in R1. And a tourist court does not have a permanent Correct. residence, and that's an Airbnb. They don't have anyone there. It's all done through the Internet. And so you're going to be passing a law that you all don't want in your neighborhoods, but you're going to put it out here on us in the R2 and the R3. Uh, and I tell you, excuse me, the Nancy, bottom of my I heart. I want to clarify that while I live in an older part of the town, our property may be R1, but I am surrounded by R2. Mm -hmm. But your property is R1. And you're in an R1, but, and but so is Mr. Rasmus. Are R2. So I am talking it's about something that R1. would impact directly across my street. And Stephen lives in R1. I think uh, most everybody up here lives in an R1 home. And yeah, I do Ms. hope Dyson's from the there. bottom of my heart. To be clear, an Airbnb is also being proposed in R1 tonight. No, that's not what he said. He's saying mm -hmm. if you yes, live sir. on site and rent a room, that's a form of Airbnb. That would be allowed in R1. If you but, don't live on site, mm -hmm. that would be allowed in R2 under Clint's proposal. Yes, but Those the are ones. Those are Airbnbs, okay? No. One is a bed and breakfast, even though they don't serve breakfast. An Airbnb is done through the internet, and there is no one that lives there permanently. That's an Airbnb, and that's how they're, they're operating, so at least some of them are. Nancy, there's the three different definitions. The bed and breakfast, the tourist home, and the tourist court. Right. And then I just kind of want to interject something because I, I have a cousin who lives in Edmond and she comes here. Her father lives here. And he's um, They've had a lot of family illness and she has four children and travels with special medical equipment. So every time she comes to this area, she can't stay in a hotel. She has to rent an Airbnb or a VRBO to stay here. Um, every weekend that she's came down over the last year and a half while she was dealing with this family illness, every Airbnb that she's rented has been an R1 home. Um, you might be shocked to be surprised how many people rent those. People who own them, like myself, who might be gone for a month and might rent my house out while I'm gone. Um, or people who have their home listed with a local realtor who might be uh, attempting to sell the home, but in the meantime, they need revenue to pay the mortgage on that R1 residence. Um, so I think making the assumption that only these larger Airbnbs, like I know the, the certain ones that, that you've expressed concerns about, I, I think that we as a city can't stop every resident in town who might want to Airbnb their home for one weekend. And I think the only way to to police that's that would be home. to like that's I someone's home, and that's the difference. Three is that some of these Airbnbs they don't have anyone living there permanently. Right. Some do and some don't. That's what right. I'm saying is, I mean, there's thousands of them. So you're not going to have those in R1. I think people are currently, they are currently in R1. What's proposed here does not include, it includes a tourist court moving from C2 up to R3 and R2. The only change for R1 would be the tourist home, and that's like a bed and breakfast. So it's going to move a bed and breakfast into R1, but it's not going to move an Airbnb into R1. We appreciate your points. Um, at this point, we've spent most of an hour on the B and B question. Do we have one more comment? I'd be willing to give five more minutes to this topic, and then we need to move on to others that may want to address other I have items. a short, just short. I would like to just make a closing comment, please, Ms. Mayor. Uh, from the bottom of my heart, I hope that you are not the type of elected officials uh, who pass laws for voters that you are unwilling to subject yourselves to. Thank you very much. Um, in my experience, whenever somebody takes over a property to create a tourist court, as we call it, Airbnb is a brand, not, not a type. So we're talking about a tourist court. 
Uh, when somebody takes over a property to do that, they fix the property up usually. Um, Tyler bought the house on the corner of Morgan and College. It was falling apart, overgrown for years. It looks great now. Uh, the house on Academy that's in question a lot, that was a party house when I was in college. I mean, it was, it was a disaster and it looks beautiful when you drive by it now. So, so I would think that um, the properties in general would be increased, which would bring up the value around. Uh, as far as non-conforming goes, if it's in the code, it's conforming, so it's not non-conforming. Um, we're talking R2, which is multifamily. R1 is single family. R2 is a multifamily, correct? Correct. So technically, Actually, sorry, it's two family. Two family. R3 is multifamily. Duplex. Correct. We're talking duplexes. So would someone staying at a house for the weekend produce more traffic than a duplex would? which would be two families. I don't think so, but we could tear down any house in an R2 and build a duplex and that generally would not be a problem to, and that would do an increase in traffic probably more than an Airbnb would because you have the same amount of people staying as if somebody lived in that house full time. So um, I got kids, I get it. I live in Keys though, somebody could put a pig farm next to me and there's nothing I can do about it. So at least the city can do something about something but I could have the worst of the worst next to me and there's nothing I can do right. so. if I may to something that would help uh, the city planner I think in recommendations is if anyone has any comments as to a, a max amount of rooms or a max amount of overnight guests you would like in these kind of definitions because I will say to the point about hotel motel tax it's already in the code wherein if you have over five rooms that are being sold for more than I think a dollar or something of that nature, whatever the code says, you would be taxed over the hotel motel without any change to our code. So if you had an Airbnb with five rooms and you rented those out, you would be providing that tax under our code. But the tourist home says four or less rooms, the way it's written. So I just wanted to bring that out to everybody if there's any concept as to that. We have to follow fire code, as does everybody who owns a house or rents a house or any of that. Um, I'm all for the tax, so just to put that on there. Um, and what was the third thing that you said? Well, I'm just saying, under the current definition, a tourist home would not do a hotel motel because it maxes out at four right. rooms to rent, so to speak. Oh, I think, I think it says five rooms, I believe. Right? If, if you have a tourist court, you cannot get regular homeowner's insurance, so there's a two-night minimum on that. I don't know if that makes a difference to anybody. But there are no one night stays. Uh, you just you can't do it. So you can do it without insurance. If, if you rented you your house on on as a tourist court without insurance, you would be crazy. John, very so quickly. This very specific. Is this is very specific issue, Mr. Lloyd. Okay. The if you look at the words that you all use in your context, also in all one and all two. If you look at the actual uh, wording here, it says a dwelling. It doesn't say a single family dwelling, it doesn't say multiple family dwelling. It doesn't indicate it. it could be one, two, or three, because it says dwelling. What would be the prefix to that word in terms of limiting the scope of what we're attempting to do? If you look at page uh, seven and right in breakfast on page two, it says dwelling. Is it an R1, R2, or three, right? When you index the very beginning of it, you have R1, single family dwelling, correct? Then R2, two family dwelling. Okay, what is the modifier that, we, that you are addressing in this particular issue? And that's what I'm attempting to understand because it doesn't attempt to define the type of dwelling in the legislation that you're proposing. Is everyone with me on that? Does anyone have any questions? Mr. Lloyd? No, I understand what you're saying. Bobby? I understand your comment. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Moving on to any other concerns related with the ordinance changes. Uh, I just wanted to talk about the empty buildings that are in town. Um, and but a lot of them are being filled up and talking about having growers next door to Domino's Pizza uh, a 
I mean, that's going to run Domino's Pizza out of business. And I know that there are some vacant <laughs> buildings there, <laughs> but I don't think people want to smell the marijuana manure growing stuff there. Thank you, Nancy. Are there other questions or concerns? Well, uh, are you all going to be taking a vote on this? Do you know? Not tonight, no. This is just a hearing. So, so there might be another... It will come to council. And Clint, just to clarify, you said earlier <coughs> the language needs to be cleaned up and corrected and reissued, and it has to be reposted. Uh, so we repost it approximately what's the earliest this could come back to council for 15 it. days 15, 15 days, days is the notification Probably for you in the newspaper. to be able to take action so you want to change c3 yes okay yeah it's it's we're good if you don't want to change anything in the c3 district okay. so if you know the thing about like the used automobile sales mm -hmm. if you're fine for the time being of it staying in c2 general commercial um, I don't know if I don't know if we proposed anything else going to C3. So otherwise, if, if we're not really worried about that situation, then we can move forward and not repost. If we're not modifying or amending C3, then we're good. But it seems like this would be the most opportune time to change that to clean it up instead of having to come back and rehash this again. And I think so. Okay. All right. So your recommendation, as city planner, would be to repost it in the paper and bring it up to reconsideration again in 15 days after it's been posted. I think so. So this is September 11th. So potentially the earliest we would be looking at would be... Uh, Maybe the first meeting in November because we would end up having to have two readings. Okay. Okay. Did you get that, Nancy? No. Oh, excuse me? Sorry, we, we just talked about the, the changing and the notification for the posting, so the earliest this could possibly um, come back is possibly early November. Okay, and just to make sure that I heard you right, that uh, I could put in Airbnbs anywhere in a R1 zone. Depending on whether there was someone living there. Right, and so you're making it more restricted for the zoning where you live. Uh, Tyler but Shockley, I think um, what ahead, I could, I think what that means, what they're trying to say is, I could turn my house into an Airbnb in an R1 because I live there, and so I could say I'm going to be gone over the Cherokee National Holiday and put it on the Airbnb as. A, as an air as a rental and be gone for that weekend and then maybe that's the only weekend all year that I ever put my house on the market but I as the owner because I live there can put that into Airbnb that's the only classification of an R1 correct correct it's the owner can turn their house into <laughs> it's not the owner. or like a the resident, the resident. Then it can be somebody the owner doesn't have to. It can be someone that doesn't even live here. That's the way it is. To it can be someone that lives in LA or New York and own the Airbnb. And so, what I'm asking for is what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Thank you, Nancy. So, to clarify on the Airbnb part, um, as an Airbnb owner, so Airbnb is a brand and a website. You can actually, in R1, you could rent your extra bedroom out to any person that could rent the full standalone building. So the risk with the R1, R2, R3 is all the same. Just because, say if you just had an extra bedroom in an R1, you could put that on Airbnb as the site and there are some in Tahlequah That's not that they just rent out. I'm no, I know, I'm saying we're talking. Buying a home in an R1 up on Baker Street mm -hmm. and me just operating it as an Airbnb over the internet. Yeah, they are. They're and out there right in now. R1, Absolutely. if you unless you live there, they live there and rent out you half live in house that house or a room. Somebody well, lives in that house. Same people uh, that Baker would be Street renting out the R1. house. Right, and that's so why. You do so, that so we're losing control of the conversation. So if we could go back. Here. Right. So Airbnb is a hosting website. 
So like you would rent a room in your own house in R1 to the same people that would be renting out an R2, R3 Airbnb. It would just might be, you know, four more people, five more people. But your risk in doing this, what we're talking about, is the same no matter what the zoning is. Because Airbnb doesn't have a standalone, this is your property. You can rent out a horse trailer as an Airbnb. It doesn't make a difference what you do. They're just a hosting site. So I think we need to kind of readdress like what we're doing and not just relaying it to the words Airbnb because it's wide open. Thank you. John, anything other than Airbnb? Well, no, this is more of a technical question. Uh, a lot of people, what they do is have a thing called a timeshare. What if an entity bought it, like people have in Colorado, you get a group of people together and they have a timeshare. The entity owns it and they have a proportionate amount of time that they are allowed to stay there by drawing every two weeks. Uh, how would this be impacted in terms of the regulations you're proposing? That's the question I have. If you would, just give that some consideration. Any other comments, questions for this body related to any of the zoning changes that are here? Not hearing any, then we will go ahead and close this public hearing. Thank you very much for being here.